right, ladies, let's roll. This is our last class, and I hope that it's been really helpful to you. And that tonight, I'm so glad you came because this is, bitterness is something that is very insidious. Um, because I can remember thinking, oh, I'm not bitter. I heard, I heard teaching on bitterness, and I'm not bitter at anyone. And really believing that. And yet, something came up, and it was like, oh my word, I am bitter. <laughs> that I, it was just a surprise. I, hardly, I didn't even realize it. So it is a dangerous habit. Bitterness is a dangerous habit that not only destroys our relationships with others, but affects our relationship with God and even our own physical, mental, and emotional health. It's amazing how your emotions can affect your health, isn't it? When you allow yourself, you know, even depression or some of those other things, your body was made as a whole and it does affect you the way you think in your spiritual life. Okay, here we go, defining bitterness. Here are some of the words that uh, are used to describe it in the dictionary. Hard to bear, grievous, distressful, causing pain, piercing, stinging. That's actually the Greek. The Greek means um, sharp and piercing. And so it kind of sh it pierces yourself basically is what bitterness does. Um, characterized by intense antagonism or hostility. Hard to admit or accept. Yeah, I didn't even realize it. Resentful, you become resentful or cynical. And a lot of times people who are bitter will say, oh, I'm not, I'm not bitter, I'm just telling you the truth. That person did this to me, you know, and I, that's just being true, honest about it. But there is a resentment there anyway, you know. So you want to be careful of that. Okay, but the biblical definition is an internal self-afflicting wound. Like I said, it the Greek is pikria. Sounds like picking, right? Pikria. And it means extreme sharpness. And this is an excellent, I love the definition, drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. <laughs> that is what it does. That is what bitterness does. And you sometimes think, well, I have a right to feel this way. What they did was painful and hurtful. But you're hurting yourself when you do that and offending God. And it's a resentful, unforgiving attitude. Bitterness is the predictable result of unbiblical habits of dealing with hurt. And it's described as a root. And in Hebrews 12, 15, it says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and defiling many. And I just want you, if you have your Bibles, turn to that passage in Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 15, because I want you to read Hebrews 12, 14. Because it says in Hebrews 12, 14, leading up to this verse, It says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. If you're making every effort to live in peace with all men, are you holding things against them? No. And so then it fits, it flows right into that next verse that no one would miss the grace of God, the grace he gives to be able to forgive, and that no bitter root would grow up and cause trouble and defile many. And you've probably heard this before, when bitterness is described as a root, it goes down deep. And I don't, I garden and have any, I don't know if any of you have thistles. If you pull a thistle out of the ground, it's a tough root to get out, isn't it? Because it goes down and then it turns. <laughs> and so you, it's not just straight down like a dandelion. It goes down and it turns. And then there are violets. Like you, can't, you can hardly eradicate violets if you try to get them out of your garden. They're, so roots can be very hard. And God's trying to communicate to that. When someone hurts you, now this is in your notes here, this kind of progression into bitterness. When someone hurts you, it is as if that person dropped a seed of bitterness into the soil of your heart. Now, I just want to pause, push the pause button. People can hurt us. I don't want to minimize that. 
you may have been hurt deeply. And, and that is a fact that, you know, and I don't know what that person did to you. Sometimes it's words, sometimes it's actions, sometimes it's physical, sexual abuse, it's, it's real, right? We live in a sin-cursed world. And you, I, I want to make sure you understand I'm not going to minimize that aspect of it. Um, okay, so the person drops the seed of bitterness into the soil of your heart. At that point, you can choose to respond in two ways. Either you can reach down and pluck up that seed, that seed of bitterness, by forgiving your offender, or you can begin to cultivate the seed by reviewing the hurt over and over again in your mind. And bitter, bitterness is the result of dwelling too long on the hurt. That's a quote from Lou Priolo in Bitterness, the Root that Pollutes. And then he made this chart, and it's included in your notes, and it's just an excellent example of how you can get there. Like you can have the eternal, internal thought of, I can't believe he did that to me. And that's like pressing the seed of hurt into the soil of your heart. And then you think, what a jerk, he's so self-centered. That's like covering it over and fertilizing it, yeah. <laughs> now, he never admits he's wrong. He always blah, blah, blah. That's your, your aerating the soil around your seed. Um, he always makes me clean up these messes. Why did God give me such a loser for a husband? Like watering the seed. He's such an idiot. You fertilize the hurt, the seed starts to sprout. I need to get out of this marriage. Then I don't have to deal with all this craziness. Your weed, you, you've got your little sprout growing and the roots are growing deeper. And then you get to, he's not gonna treat me like this, I'm out of here. When he realized that he's lost me, he's gonna be as hurt as I am right now. And you're putting the finishing touches on a greenhouse that protects your stinkweed <laughs> and charging admission for people to see it. You know, and, you know that's funny, but that's, that is the way it goes. And if you don't stop those thoughts, right at that very, that very beginning, like, I can't believe he did that to me. And I'm gonna help you tonight. We're gonna look at how the God's word has helped for us in, in plucking those seeds back out of the soil so they don't take root and grow. All right. The hurt is not always objective or rooted in reality. And that is very real too. You may imagine that someone hurt you. I can't believe she looked at me that way. Or can you believe so-and-so did this to me when it, it wasn't intended to hurt you at all and it was a misunderstanding or you thought you knew what they said or what they did and you were wrong. So it can be real or imagined. Um, and let's see, here we go. The hurt can include being sinned against by another person or simply offended by another person, and that would be, maybe they didn't particularly sin against you, but, but you didn't like what they said, or they thought it was inappropriate or hurt, but they never meant to hurt you. Okay, bitterness is a deep, settled anger, too. It's very closely related to anger. And anger, um, this anger does not only react against the offense, but it develops a deep-seated hatred about the actual person who committed the offense. Um, and you may, okay, so we're going to talk about here the evidence of bitterness. Now, you've got a list of things there that are going to help you analyze whether you're bitter, but here's what I want you to understand, is you may only exhibit one of these characteristics. You may have them all, <laughs> but you may have one, and it may just come and go. So don't just think, oh, I'm not like that, and I'm not like that, therefore I'm not bitter, okay? So just do some careful thought as we go through these. Um, you have a hard time resolving conflicts with this person because you're unwilling to forgive them. You keep remembering. You know, I, I, I think of um, children who have been touched by divorce, divorce and remarriage. You know, that can be a very deep-seated bitterness in that and can come up that way. You engage in acts of revenge, maybe not something violent, but spiteful comments, backbiting. You withdraw, silent treatment, cold shoulder, um, outbursts. You have outbursts of anger. There's always this simmering dislike of this person 
in your interactions and it's easy to get wrathful towards them. Um, sarcasm. Mean-spirited joking, snide remarks, scornful replies, you know, that you were hurt and now you just send a barb back. Condescension or criticism. Looking down on that person saying, well, you know, they're so blah, blah, blah. They can't think right or whatever. How about operate in an intolerant way, being hypersensitive to perceived hurts. Hypersensitivity gets you in trouble. <laughs> um, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. It's in Proverbs. But yeah, don't be quick to be offended. Um, a rising level of disrespect. If this offender is an authority, you may be impatient, just feeling this impatience toward them. Be an employer. A significant amount of time spent remembering the details. This is dangerous because the more you replay it, the more you can unintentionally embellish it, you know, and make it bigger than it was. That's just the way we tend to be. We tend to make the sins of others bigger than our own sins. We, we just do. Okay. And because of significant investment of emotional energy, it, it's needed in order to maintain a grudge. The hurt person could be suffering from depression or exhaustion. This is like bitterness on steroids when you get to that point. And the offended person could be doubting their salvation because Matthew 6, 12, and then 14 and 15 says, forgive us our debts. Remember Jesus said this is how you should pray. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And if the person's a believer and they know those verses and they're just not forgiving, not forgiving, they can end up, you know, wondering if they're really saved. They probably should wonder if they keep going down that path, quite frankly, and aren't forgiving. Okay, so now with the bright side, biblical forgiveness. Okay, Luke, look up Luke 17, 3 through 10. Luke 17, 3 through 10. Okay, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said, to the Lord, increase our faith. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> and the Lord said, if you have faith like a mustard seed and you'd say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In other words, he's saying here, faith is not the issue. It's not faith that you need. He said, which of you, now this is where the answer is, which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will, not, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, properly clothe yourself, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too. When you do all the things which are commanded to you from God, should say we are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. So it's your duty. He's saying it's your duty to forgive. Just like a slave just serves and serves and serves and that's his duty, it's part of your duty to forgive. It's in your job description. All right. Forgiveness is granted only when someone sins against you. And if you see in that passage, in verse 4, it says, if he sins against you and then returns to you and says, I repent, then you forgive him. 
you only grant forgiveness to someone who asks for it. Now, you can, God wants you to have a heart that is ready to forgive and that is ready to grant that forgiveness if they come and repent. And we'll talk about that some more. Okay, so um, you need to get the log out of your own eye, right? Matthew 7, 4 and 5 says, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So, how do you practically do that? You have someone who has sinned against you. Maybe they haven't come and asked forgiveness. You need to get the log out of your own eye. What might that log be? What are some of the things you can be thinking to help get your brain turned around? Because you were focusing on the speck in that person's eye, the little piece of dust in their eye, and you're thinking, I gotta help. I've got to tell them about this. I've got to go get that speck out of their eye. They are sinning. And God says you have a log in your own eye. How, how, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard for me to get there. And, and there have been times in my life when I have prayed and said, God, I know I have a log in my eye. I am not seeing it right now. <laughs> yeah. So the log is that you are judging their sin? Yes. That is part of it. That's just part of it. Part of it is you are acting as a judge, judging their sin. That's... That's a good point, Teresa, and that's excellent, and that's definitely part of the log in your own eye. What else would be the log in your own eye? Debbie? You probably sinned yourself. Oh, hello? <laughs> Have we sinned? I mean, yes, that person sinned against you, but are you aware of the own, your own Mount Everest of sin? Well, once again, it's pride, which creeps up all the time in this whole class. I mean, no, yes. <laughs> Yes, it's pride. Right, it's pride. And, and that just rears its ugly head all over the place. It's like, have you ever heard that game whack-a-mole? You know, <laughs> boom, boom, pride. You get it in one spot and you have to whack it in another. Yeah, exactly. And so when you're in a situation like that, it can be really hard to turn your brain around. I just know it is for me sometimes to think, okay, I've got a log in my own eye, and I do pray. I have prayed on more than once. Okay, Lord, I, I know I'm a big sinner. Help me see that right now before I talk to this person. Remind me of my own sinfulness so that I go with a humble heart. Yeah, lovely prayer. He loves to answer that too. <laughs> he will show you your own sinfulness. Sometimes the offended person is the one who has to initiate forgiveness, and that might be you. So if, let's say someone has sinned against you, they never come to you, and they, they really did sin against you. Um, this happens a lot, unfortunately, where the person doesn't seek forgiveness, and you may need to go to them and help them see that their sin, they really did sin against you. But once you get the log out of your eye, then you're a lot more ready to do that in a godly way, right? Um, and Proverbs 19.11, here it is in your notes, it's a, your glory. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. It's his glory to overlook a transgression. 1 Peter 4.8, above all, keep a fervent love for one another because love covers over a multitude of sins. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could let love cover over more sins that people might commit against us? Sometimes that's hard to do, but isn't it wonderful when you can let that love cover it? So how do you know if love covers it? How do you know? You think, well, I'm not going to let that, what that person did, that roommate, that friend who, you know, slighted me, I'm going to let love cover it. And you say, I'm not going to say anything to her. How's that go for you? Anybody ever had trouble with that? <laughs> I, I do sometimes. Sometimes I can move on, and then that way you know love has covered it because you're able to move on and not think about it. But if you can't move on without thinking about it, love's not covering it, right? And in that case, you do need to talk about it. So it's like, okay, the cover's got kicked off. 
Well, it's not covering it. You better go talk about it, right? And, and it may be something small, too. Sometimes that just happens, and the small thing may just be really bugging you. But don't let it just continue to bug you. Get the log out of your own eye, and then communicate about it. Questions, thoughts, comments? Um, another verse for the conditionalness of forgiveness is Luke 17, 3. It says, be, guard, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And here's the conditional part. If he repents, forgive him. Now, when Jesus was on the cross and he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, he was praying a prayer that was seen into the future when these people would repent and they would be forgiven and come to faith in him. And a number of the people, like the centurion who was there, right, at the foot of the cross, some of those people were brought to Christ. But he had the heart that was ready to forgive, right? Great example, as always. Okay, sometimes the person who sinned against you may come to you to seek forgiveness and you may uh, hopefully be ready to forgive them, right? And Matthew 5, 23 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So God places a high priority on solving problems, seeking forgiveness, um, going to other people when they sin against you, that, that it's more important than worship. If you're offering your gift at the altar, stop. Go. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Everybody with me? Okay. Forgiveness is expensive. It can be very expensive. I, I'm thinking about the wife whose husband has cheated on her. I'm thinking about maybe a stepdaughter who's been sexually abused by a stepfather. I'm thinking about um, all kinds of things, right? Maybe you were beaten as a child. So there can be some pretty expensive acts of forgiveness. You're not regarding the offense as nothing. You're not saying it's no big deal, rub some dirt in it. <laughs> you know, you're, you are, it, it's, it costs as much as that sin against you. And then I have a quote here from Lou Priolo that says, one of the graduate school professors used to speak of forgiveness as being like giving an expensive gift. And when you forgive someone, it's like you take his offense, you put it in a nice colorful box, you put a bow on it, and you hand it back to the person. And you're saying, it's going to be as if you didn't do this. It's going to be to me as if you had never done this. It's expensive, isn't it? It can be, if it's a very serious offense. Forgiveness is not an emotion, because you may never feel like forgiving that person. Remember our train? Don't let, if you let your emotions run, you may never forgive. But it's a promise. And it's an act of the will. In forgiveness, the hurt person is vowing to no longer hold the trespasser's sins against him. You're not going to dwell about it on it. You're not going to talk about it to yourself. You're not going to bring it up to others. And we, around here at Faith, we talk about forgiveness as a threefold promise. You promise not to bring up the issue to yourself. You promise not to bring it up to the offender, the person who did it. And you promise not to bring it up to others. Now, you may have to, let me just put, give you a caveat. <laughs> You may have to bring it up to the person who offended you. For example, the husband who cheated on his wife asks for forgiveness. She forgives him, and he does it again. It's not like she's not going to bring that up. And the focus of bringing up a past sin would be to help that person see the pattern of sin. And that they, okay, you ask for forgiveness, but it, I'm, I'm not convinced that that was sincere. You're doing this again, and your concern at that point, if you're being godly, your concern is for them and their eternal salvation, not for yourself and your hurt. And that's tough to do, but God can give you the grace to do it. I have a story to read you about this. Um, have, have you all heard of Corey Ten Boom? Who has not heard of Corey Ten Boom? Okay, she was in a prison camp during World War II. In fact, her whole family 
um, she was, her, her family lived in Holland and they hid, they rescued Jews who were escaping from the Nazis. And so her, her father, her sister and herself worked together to hide Jews who were trying to escape Hitler. This is her story, part of it. I was at a church in Munich when I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had just come from Holland to the defeated Germany to bring the message that God forgives. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just the fact that she would go back and want to tell the Germans who had been so brutal to her family that God would forgive. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture because, maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I liked to think that that's where our sins were, for, were thrown, our forgiven sins. We confess our sins, I said, and God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their wraps, and in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form in front of me, her ribs sharp beneath her parchment skin. How thin she was. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland, and this man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. And by the way, her father and sister died there. She survived. Now he was in front of me. His hand was thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He could not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among the thousands of women? But I remembered him. And the leather crop swinging from his belt, I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. Hmm, so he did not remember me. But since that time, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again he held out his hand, will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins again and again had to be forgiven, I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there with his hand held out, but it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I knew I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it was not only a commandment of God, but a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were also able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with this coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. Lord, you supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, 
I thrust my hand into the one that was stretched out to me, and as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Isn't that, that, and isn't that interesting how she said she understood so much better God's love when she forgave? And that it was definitely an act of the will. So I wanted you to hear that because if you've been hurt, it can be a big deal. But God is bigger, right? And he can give you the grace to forgive. And in doing so, you will experience his love more and know him better. Okay, forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. The offender may need to walk in righteousness for a period of time before trust is built again. Forgiveness is immediate, but trust takes a little bit of time. But you need to beware of the temptation to not allow not trusting to morph into bitterness. And I'll just use the example again of a wife whose husband has been unfaithful. It can be awfully easy to just say, I don't trust him and never move past that. And that's a hard thing for women to move past, or men, you know, whichever the case may be. But um, love believes all things, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love hopes all things, believes all things. So you should have in your heart the desire to trust the person, the hope that you can trust them. Like uh, Ronald Reagan used to say, trust but verify. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anybody remember that? <laughs> Some of us oldie moldies here. <laughs> We're able to forgive others when we remember the great debt that we have been forgiven by God. And Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we tend to look at someone else's sin as theirs is a Mount Everest and ours is this little pile over here. That's not it. I mean, ladies, the longer you lock, walk with Jesus and the closer that you get to him, the more you realize what a big sinner you are. And we all have Mount Everest. We all do. We just don't see it very easily. <laughs> all right. We're able to forgive when we focus on God's sovereignty. This is something that helped me so much with um, the bitterness that I had to work through in my life. I... Um, once I realized that God had planned that, God had ordained that person to mistreat me that way. God had ordained for them to say what they said and do what they did. That was part of God's plan for my life. He, in his sovereignty, allowed it to happen. It wasn't out of his control. And he's good. Okay, Genesis. Let's see, Genesis... 42, Genesis 50, the story of Joseph. Okay, does anybody not know the story of Joseph? The story of Joseph, he's sold into slavery by his brothers. Did he have occasion to be bitter? Oh my goodness, over and over, right? Bitter toward his brothers, bitter toward Potiphar and his wife, because then when he was falsely accused, he was thrown into prison, right? Bitter towards the... The baker or whoever forgot him, you know, said, well, remember me. When I'll interpret your dream, but remember me when you tell Pharaoh your dream so I can get out of prison. They didn't. He forgot him. He could be bitter at God. Like, he, but was he bitter? I mean, he probably had some time to think it through. He might have tended to go there, but he didn't. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, he says to his brothers when he confronts them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring about the present result and to preserve many lives. Now, he couldn't see that when he was going through it. I mean, at the very end, he was be able, able to look back and see how he was able to provide food for his family. But when he was going through all that, he had no idea how God was gonna use it for good. It was just a ton of evil that kept happening to him, and he was innocent. And evil after evil kept happening to him. So if you're in that situation, 
you don't know the end of the story. And we can take great comfort when, from a story like Joseph's where we can look at the end and say, God was using that for good. And walk in faith and believe that there was a reason and that God can use that evil for good in your life and to bring about good and glory to himself. And that takes faith, right? It takes walking by faith and believing that God's promises are true and that what he says is true even when you don't feel like it. it's true. The train. <laughs> Put truth, let truth run your life, right? Okay, any comments, questions? Okay, there may be times when the offender will not or is not able to properly take care of his sin against you. Perhaps the person has died and you never got to resolve it. Or perhaps they're just not seeking forgiveness. And in that case, you still want to have a heart that is willing to forgive, right? So you want to you imagine in your mind, if this person came to me right now and said, will you forgive me, um, that you'd say, yeah, I forgive you. I forgive you. That you could say it. Even if it had to happen like Corey Ten Boom, where it was just an act of the will. All right, using the gospel to kill bitterness. Yay, Jesus is the perfect example, isn't he, of responding to harsh treatment without growing bitter. Yes, Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Yes, and even as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, as they were rolling the dice to divide up his clothes. He's an excellent example. The gospel reminds us of how much we've been forgiven by God, and it's our incentive to forgive others. Okay, open your Bibles to Matthew 18. 21. This is worth reading. And since for the sake of time, well, we're doing okay with time. I'll read it. Matthew 18, verse 20, starting at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Aren't you glad you don't live in those times, huh? <laughs> the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, a much, much smaller amount. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay his debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So it ended up a whole lot worse for him, right? This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. That's an eye-opener, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if that kind of startles you, but it does me. God expects us to forgive. And when we understand how much we've sinned, just as the person in this parable should have understood, how much God has forgiven us, 
then we shouldn't be unwilling to forgive someone else, right? Now let me just remind you that there is an eternity that is far more important than the here and now, right? But the here and now does impact eternity. And that person who's wronged you may be a wicked person who is not willing to repent. And if that's the case, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God will repay that person. And it's, it's going to be a big thing, right? Because eternal damnation is a big deal. So when we don't have a view of eternity, when we don't realize that God will pay back the people who have been wicked to you, then you, it would make it a lot harder to forgive, right? But when you understand that God, God will make things right, then that should put your heart at ease, that that person will be repaid. And there are wicked people who don't repent. But God wants all men everywhere to repent, right? And, and when you understand if you, if you study hell at all, and if I was reading Puritans, and they, so they wrote a lot about hell, and if you understand hell at all, you, you really are impacted by that, and you really realize that you, you don't want people to go there. And, and God is the one who will decide that, and his ways are just and right. But um, please, please take to heart that there is an eternity, and when you forgive, you're being like Christ, and you are, and God rewards that. God rewards those who seek him. Um, he rewards those who follow him, and that's what you're doing. So there is an eternal perspective that I'd like you to have on this too. Any questions? Okay. Okay. We need to be reminded of our own constant and ongoing need for forgiveness as Christians, to be quick to forgive. And so let me ask you this question. When was the last time you confessed your sin, your own sin? When was the last time you had a good confession session? <laughs> a confession session with Jesus. And you really were honest with him about your own sin. Because if you don't do that, you're not, you're, you're not going to be as forgiving to others because you won't have a, such a tender heart towards the Lord as he forgives you for all your craziness, right? All your crazy thoughts, and your crazy actions when nobody's looking, and your, you know, all of that. So please let us all, and I'm talking to myself every bit as much, to be quick to confess our own sin so that we'll be quick to... Um, forgive others. Okay, and we want to be ready to mirror God's grace and mercy towards us when we have the opportunity to forgive others. You're made in God's image. He's a forgiving God. He wants you to be a reflection of him to this messed up world. And when people see you forgiving, that's staggering. Because does the lost world forgive? No. No, they get even, right? They get mad. No, believers, I mean, you see believers in Christ, like the Corey Ten Boom story, you think, who could have forgiven that? Only God and his power. And it is an incredible display of God's power when you forgive, when he enables you to forgive. You are reflecting God and you are um, showing others what God is like. Okay, we must fight the temptation to take over God's role as judge. And Teresa mentioned that early on. When we become bitter, we're functioning as the judge who assesses the ed evidence, renders a verdict, and delivers the sentence. And when we take vengeance, um, we are robbing God of his job, right? He's the only one who knows exactly what's going on in that person's heart and life. And I can remember a situation um, where my husband and I are, he, we're in business, he's, I say we're in business, he's the one who does all the work. 
<laughs> I cook, <laughs> take care of the kids. But um, uh, we had our own business, and at one point there was a man who had cheated us. We've had several people cheat us. And I remember in this particular instance, this guy was just, he behaved in an incompetent way, and we had paid him fairly, and he was just really abusing that and had done a lot of things that were wrong, <laughs> just sinful. And we could have sued him. But I'm so thankful that my husband decided not to. And we didn't. We prayed. We just prayed for him. And we found out later that at the very time his wife had left him, he was going through a really messy divorce. His, his, his mind wasn't in his business that was the service that we had purchased. You know, and, and we never really resolved that, but we trust God that God did. You know, and that it, all we have belongs to him anyway. And so we just trusted God with that. So you found, you know, finding out later that he went through, he was going through this awful divorce kind of helped us think, okay, I mean, this, this poor man has a big mess in his life. But you know, we don't always find stuff like that out, right? We don't know, only God does. He knows what's going on in that other person's life. And we don't. And it may be what has contributed to what they've done to you, right? So God is God. Let's not take his role away from him. James 4.12 says, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? And Romans 12, never take revenge, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm going to mention a little caveat again. <laughs> I'm not saying that you should never have a lawsuit against someone. I'm not saying that. But as believers in Christ, we need to think long and hard before we do something like that. Because our goal is to glorify God, not to get our money, right? And so that's just uh, a way that we can honor God. Okay, when we're able to see that the offender is caught in sin and is deceived and enslaved, it's easier to have compassion, the compassion necessary to forgive. And so, for example, in my, our business, the, if that man ever came to us and asked for forgiveness, we would be ready to forgive him. He hasn't. <laughs> but that's God's business, right? That's God's business. You can't force somebody to seek your forgiveness. And in John 8, 34, this is something that's great to remember. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And you just don't know how that other person might be enslaved by sin at this point. They're slave to sin. And the wages of sin is death, right? Okay, and then Psalm 73, this is another thing that's kind of helpful sometimes in uh, thinking through these situations. In Psalm 73, it talks about the wicked and how they may not suffer. You've suffered and they didn't suffer from, and they hurt you. And in verse 18, he says, surely you place them, the wicked, on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. And so it makes sense, like there's the eternal picture. There's, there, is, there are consequences to sin, and that person who wronged you has, will suffer those consequences. And if it was a great deal of wickedness, they will be destroyed. It's pretty sobering, right? Okay, then back to ourselves. Reminding ourselves of our own depravity helps us from sinning in the ways like the person who sinned against us. It's an act of grace that we're not as wicked, we're not more wicked. I mean, isn't it amazing? God saved us. We're so sinful. We could have gone down any number of paths. And I hope you're honest with yourself and you think about where you could have been if Jesus hadn't saved you. I mean, that's a staggering thought for me because I know my... I don't totally know my heart, God does, but I know the wickedness that's there and what I might have done. So remember your own depravity. You're, if you don't, 
and you just rehearse someone else's sin, you're downplaying the fact that at that very moment you're sinning against them, right? So, and that's pride, like we said early on. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. When you refuse to forgive, you are being proud, and there will be destruction. Right? But here's some more answers. Learn how to overcome evil with good. Romans 12 says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. To anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. It may not be possible, right? If possible, be at peace with all men. Never take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, as mine to avenge, I will repay. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So God wants you to not just be neutral and just not do anything. Say, well, I'm not taking revenge. No, God wants you to do good to that person. So what are some of the good things that you could do towards a person who's offended you? Crystal. Yes, yes, just to show them love, even if they don't respond back. You're being like God. You're being like Jesus. Yeah, Debbie. Well, maybe you've not spoken this way, but I've had to continue to be good just so God will put more of cold on their head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the burning coals would be the hope that the person would be convicted, that your kindness and your love towards them would just convict the socks off of them. And that's the burning coals. But yeah, I'll be good and convict them. <laughs> yeah, not so good, Deb. You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we all are. We all are. I mean, what I do, what helps me is to pray, to pray for that person. And I just get honest before the Lord, and I just say, Jesus, I, I don't like this person right now. <laughs> I just don't like them. And I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm so sinful. Show me the log in my eye. Help me to see my own sin. Um, help me to do good to them. And then I'll start by doing, praying that God would bless them praying that God would be good to them in some way, you know, that he would show his mercy and love to them. And when you start to pray that way, God can use that to turn your heart. I, I know he has in my case. But I think prayer is a really important thing. And the enemy is sin. I mean, we've all, we're all sinners. And we want to remember that. We're commanded to win the battle commanded. That's a command. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's not a suggestion. <laughs> it's a command. <laughs> and to return a blessing for cursing. Now this is a great verse. If you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.15. This is, I, I just love what I found out about the Greek in this. 1 Thessalonians 5.15. Anyone want to read that for us? Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. No one pays back wrong for wrong. And... That, that version doesn't quite say it as well. That was the NIV, but this one, I think, says it better. See that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another. And that word there, seek after, is the Greek word, the same, exact same Greek word that is translated in other places, persecute. Isn't that interesting? 
persecute them with good. Like, seek after it. Like, when they would persecute people, they're hounding them, right? They're seeking them until they find them. They're going to find them and drag them off to jail. You're supposed to have that same intensity of seeking them to do good to them. Isn't that something? Yeah. When I found that out, I thought, wow, that just gives it a whole new intensity. It's not like, well, gee, yeah, maybe I'll do them good if I think about it <laughs> on a certain day. No, I said it's like the same intensity as persecution. Seek after. So you have to plan ahead. <laughs> yeah. Be careful. In Romans 17, 12, 17 says, be careful to do what is right. Be careful. You think, you plan. Careful, so you have to plan what you're going to do that's right. And that's why I started to ask you, what are some of the things, and I start with prayer. Pray for that person, that God would bless them, that God would help me to see their good qualities, that God would help me to see their potential, what they're doing right. Um, what are some other things you could do? I mean, just, I mean, it can be any number of things. They won't all apply to all situations, but you could just, you know, mow a neighbor's lawn, right? Um, somebody whose dog always poops in your yard, you can just clean it up, <laughs> and, you know. I, I'm just suggesting, you know, things like that just to help you start to think about what you could do that would be good for that person. And maybe, and if you're, if we're talking about a really wicked person that you really shouldn't be around, then you can just pray for them and just say that God would, God would convict them and that they would come to salvation and faith in Christ. Sometimes, and it wasn't mentioned in the lesson, but um, it's not like you can take care of this issue one time and then you're done. One and done. Okay, I forgave her. Um, I'm not bitter toward her. Now I can tackle something else. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> no, no. And so there is an ongoing habit in your mind, disciplining your mind to not allow your brain to go back there, right? And to keep remembering. And like we said, the threefold promise, you want to have a heart that's ready to forgive, even if they didn't ask for forgiveness. A heart that's not bringing that issue up to yourself, not bringing it up to them, and not bringing it up to others, right? And so if you're already doing that, you're not talking to your best friend about it, you're not dwelling on it, you just, but that takes mental discipline, doesn't it? Yeah. And I call it mental gymnastics, right? <laughs> it's like training for the Olympics sometimes up here between your temples, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever battled thoughts like that, but sometimes it can be a very intense battle in your mind to keep your thoughts where they need to be and focused on Scripture and God. Yeah, Debbie? We always talk about the bucket in our family. Just put it in the bucket, hand it to God. The bucket. To God. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I feel like... Don't do what I do, though. I take the bucket back. Yeah, I've heard another uh, person talk about, you know, here's, here's your fence, you know, throw it over the fence. It goes in God's yard. It's not yours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let God handle it. And, yeah, and to just discipline your mind to not allow yourself to go there. Yeah, has anybody else had these battles that rage right here? Oh, my word. Yeah, if you're going to live for Christ, there's a huge battleground right here, right? But he will help us, praise God, and one day totally redeem us. Yay! <laughs> and there will be no more battle. Won't that be wonderful? Okay, well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're so wonderful to give us these truths and to help us to see the best way to live and that the best way to live is to live with a forgiving heart. Lord, we all need your help with that. We are so sinful and we so easily remember the sins of others and forget our own. Oh God, I just pray that every one of us in this room, that from this point onward, you would just help us to be a lot more aware of our own sin, a lot more aware of how you rescued us from hell and what hell is, and a lot more grateful to you for that, and that that would just cause us to have a forgiving spirit toward others. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us such a wonderful example in your own life. Um, help us to want to be like you for your glory. Amen.